everyone welcome to our 26 blurs virtual seminar a blurs virtual seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care and this platform is brought to you by blurs Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer and uh, we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine and as always, I'm your host, Adam Getacho. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Blue Health Ethiopia. And it's a huge pleasure for us to have uh, Dr. Telahun Jiru here with us. And he's going to give us an update on the uh, approach to poisoning or uh, general management of poisoned patients. And uh, Dr. Telahun is an assistant professor of emergency medicine and critical care. Thank you so much. Uh, may I know the number of participants? Uh, yeah, uh, 139. Wow. And Thank group. you so much. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. So, and it Karamachu, it Amishachu. My name is uh, Tlahun. Uh, Tlahun Jiru. I'm an uh, uh, emergency medicine and critical care specialist. Currently working at the level of an assistant professor. At Adisha University, from uh, the specialist hospital. Is that all? Adal. Oh, but I'm so. But I'm done. All right. So I'm really thankful for uh, the Blue Health team for uh, inviting me, and uh, thank you so much. So uh, after saying this, uh, I think I can proceed to uh, my presentations. So today we'll. Uh, uh, try to you know, uh, cover and discuss uh, general management of uh, poison patients. So <clears throat> uh, this is uh, my outline. We'll uh, discuss the introduction and also general management, uh, management principle of uh, poison patient. And then uh, if you have time also, we can uh, uh, see such, uh, some specific poisoning. So hopefully we can uh, finish on time. So let's go to the next slide. So general information. So as uh, we know, uh, all chemicals have the potential to be uh, poisonous if given at a large dose. Uh, so uh, this is one of the things I, uh, I have to know in practice uh, because uh, all the uh, medications, including antibiotics, other uh, cardiac medication, antihypertensive medication that can be given uh, for a patient for a th therapeutic reason can be uh, consumed at a large dose because of you know uh, intention of uh, suicide and that can uh, also uh, cause life treating conditions. And uh, regarding poisoning, poisoning is currently becoming a worldwide uh, problem uh, that uh, consumes uh, not only healthcare uh, resource. And uh, but it also causes a premature uh, death because uh, most of uh, the age group, which is uh, 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 usually tend to uh, commit suicide, is in the age of uh, 20 to uh, 45, which is uh, a reproductive age. So it is becoming currently <clears throat> is a, a, a very uh, great uh, health burden causing health burden and consuming a lot of uh, uh, costs. So uh, poisoning occurs when exposure to substance adversely affect functions of any organ substance. So the exposure can be via uh, ingestion, which is the most common route, and then inhalation and subcutaneous and also uh, uh, injections. And uh, Fortunately, 95% of the episodes is caused by uh, caused very minor or uh, no effect, but the rest of 5% uh, can cause uh, to the level of hospital admission and uh, also mortality, which is around 1 to 2% of hospitalized patients uh, can die of due to uh, poisoning. And uh, uh, so uh, 
and it can also uh, cause uh, around 5%, uh, usually of first emergency uh, medicine uh, or emergency room vis visit, around 5% of the visit is due to uh, poisoning. So it is not uh, very uh, uh, minute problem. It's becoming a huge burden, especially in developing uh, countries. So as you can see from the picture, uh, any substance can cause uh, uh, poison uh, depending on the dose. So with epidemiology, uh, as I tried to uh, mention in the first slide, more than 2 million toxic exposure is reported in uh, 2020. This is an American study. Overall, uh, almost uh, more than 50 percent is uh, children and 60 uh, percent of fatality occurred uh, usually in the age of the 20 to uh, 48, uh, 49. So this epidemiology is also goes with uh, other studies done in a local uh, setup, uh, being around almost uh, most of our patients are under uh, 30s, and the sex wise also more than 50% uh, are uh, male. So poisoning is uh, a third uh, common cause of death. Uh, in a study done from uh, 1985 to 1995. And the fatalities are uh, commonly due to carbon monoxide poisoning or injections of other medications like analgesics, sedatives, antipsychotics, and uh, antidepressants, and also alcohol. But uh, in our setup, this is a study done in a Western uh, population. But in our studies, most of the common cause of uh, these are because of uh, organophosphates. And, uh, and uh, others are uh, clearly unknown. So overview of uh, uh, management approach. So we need to be uh, systematic and consistent uh, while evaluating and managing uh, such patient. And uh, so evaluation should start with high index of suspicion. Always, you know, usually most of patients who uh, commit uh, suicide, they don't uh, tend to you know, uh, tell the history of uh, taking the medication. So always in the patient who present with uh, changing mentation found un unconscious. Regarding the approach, the most important step is uh, recognition. So if we, re we recognize late, you know, the damage would happen and then by that time will be very difficult to uh, salvage the patient. So. Uh, the most important is early recognition of uh, the poisoning. So uh, that is uh, the first step. And then uh, we have to uh, look for uh, agents uh, involved. So that's also uh, the next because the management depends on you know, the agent that the patient took. So knowing the agent is also the next step. And then we have to assess for the severity and prediction of uh, toxicity is very important because there are patients who need to be uh, admitted to our, to ICU and uh, those who need to be uh, observed and then discharged. So disposition depends on the severity. And so we have to assess the patient uh, for uh, severity and the possible uh, complications. And the next is management of the case. So uh, we'll go uh, for uh, the management. So uh, regarding management of uh, patients who present with poisoning, uh, so these are the steps that we need to uh, follow. So first is a provision of uh, supportive care and then prevention of uh, poison absorption and administration of antidotes and enhancement of elimination of uh, the poisonous. So regarding uh, supportive care, so this is the most important one, okay, before even going to the next steps, we have to always uh, consider uh, giving supportive care, which uh, includes uh, securing the ABC of life and, uh, and then uh, subsequent follow-up and management. So regarding uh, supportive care, uh, always, uh, we have to follow ABCD of life. And so the first is protecting the airway and uh, immobilizing uh, cervical uh, spine. So patients who present with poisoning presentation can range from just uh, simple uh, dyspepsia and vomiting to you know, uh, the range of a coma. So patient can present with compromised airway, patient can you know, have multiple uh, vomiting and uh, patient can aspirate and asphyxiate and also can 
uh, die off because of hypoxia. So always the first step in management of poison is uh, securing and protecting the airway. So when we protect the airway, uh, we can then proceed to the next step. Uh, step. And the one thing we should not always forget is cervical immobilization. So um, in a patient who presented with poisoning, you know, especially alcohol poisoning, when they are drunk, <clears throat> they can be on uh, you know, highways and they can also sustain uh, road traffic accidents, uh, pedestrian injuries. So they can concomitantly also present with head injury and also cervical injury. So uh, uh, the priority should be always in uh, 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 immobilizing. The cervix should not always no consider a poisoning, and you have to suspect that the patient can have also concomitant uh, trauma. And uh, uh, after airway, we can proceed to increasing circulation and uh, you no know, putting the patient on oxygen, uh, putting the patient on a mechanical ventilator, depending on patient needs. It's also uh, sometimes uh, a mess, depending on patient condition. And uh, uh, following patient with a vital chain, a mental status chain, and pillary size also uh, very important. And uh, ECG monitoring, cardiac monitoring, and also uh, uh, continuously following for uh, the oxygenation and ventilation is also uh, mandatory because this patient can present with uh, compromised airway and can have also uh, problem with oxygenation, acid-based abnormality, which can result in uh, different range of uh, uh, respiratory embarrassment. And uh, uh, securing IV line is also important because uh, this patient can have uh, also been in shock and can have uh, vomiting and also because of different nature of uh, the medications can have you know, a potency effect. So this patient might need uh, uh, fluid, pressure and so on. So securing IV line is also one of the uh, step. And, uh, Ruling out also hypoglycemia is important because patients who present with uh, a change in mentation coma, always the easy one to you know, uh, diagnose and also easy to treat is hypoglycemia. So always patient who present with uh, change in mentation and so hypoglycemia should be uh, ruled out and if uh, there is a low uh, random blood sugar, we Poisoning patient, so always, so always, uh, we have to start with uh, ABC of life because these patients are at risk for uh, airway and breathing circulation issues because you know patient can be a comatose and can also vomit a lot and patient can have uh, airway obstruction asphyxia and uh, patient can die of airway obstructions. So securing so airways always a priority. And uh, breathing because of the aspiration, and a patient can uh, also develop aspiration pneumonia and also uh, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So, putting the patient on oxygen is also uh, mandatory, depending, and it's depending on, on the patient's uh, conditions. And uh, circ circulation also, uh, securing IV line uh, is uh, an important thing because we can give, we, need, we might need to give medications and also giving fluid uh, and also other uh, medications might be uh, necessary uh, because patient can also present in uh, cardiovascular collapse and patient might need fluid and some uh, inotropes. So after you know, securing the ABC of light, we can uh, go for uh, other management. So maybe one thing I need to emphasize here is uh, uh, and given patients where during this analogous open and standard. So this medication can be uh, given simultaneously while stability of life. Naloxone is very important you know, because uh, despite patient being you know uh, comatose and no respiratory effort. If we give naloxone before uh, considering putting the patient on mechanical ventilator, we can prevent uh, the complication related with mechanical ventilation because naloxone is uh, known for a short acting nature. So it uh, usually expects a response within a few minutes. 
So always before securing the airway, before I mean before putting the patient on mechanical ventilator, if you suspect patient uh, to have opioid poisoning, please consider uh, giving naloxones because uh, it can uh, not change the course of the disease. And uh, atropine is also very important, specifically in our setup, because patient, most of our patients are you now presented uh, with organophosphate poisoning. So by just giving atropine, we can uh, uh, we can prevent uh, the pulmonary edema, the bronchorea, and uh, we can uh, protect I and mean, clear the airways. So uh, atropine is also one of the most important. And uh, as there is a coma cocktail, so antidotes, antidote is a, a substance used to counteract the toxic action of uh, the specified agent. So it is uh, well known uh, to reduce uh, mortality, but unfortunately only 1% of uh, the poisonous agent have antidotes. So, uh, you know, because it is only few, we need to be uh, familiar uh, with those uh, poisonous agents because if we uh, know the antidotes, we can you know, and then, and, uh, change the course of a patient condition. So at least we have to know uh, the specific antidotes. So antidotes work by uh, preventing absorbations, and uh, there are also those which act by neutralizing the poisonous itself. And uh, those also, uh, there are also uh, those which uh, can antagonize the organ effect and also inhibit combustion to uh, toxic metabolite. So there are different ways in which the antidote works. So I think uh, clinical is not important. So we have to uh, know the antidotes. So <clears throat> these, are, these are the few uh, poisonous agents which has got an antidote. So the common uh, one we need to know is um, for organophosphate uh, uh, atropine and also for carbamate we can use uh, atropine and uh, for uh, anti-TB specifically azonazide uh, paradoxins antidote and for uh, TCA like antriptyline Sodium bicarb is uh, one of the most important um, management uh, uh, agent. So we have to always consider uh, patient present in severe conditions. And uh, maybe the other is <clears throat> uh, snake bites. No? Uh, anti uh, snake antivenom is also uh, antidote. And any acetyl cysteine is for acetyl at least. We have to know a few of uh, the antidotes. So regarding uh, resuscitation of patient who presented in uh, arrest, and, uh, we have to prolong our uh, cardiopulmonary uh, resuscitation because as I said, epidemiologically, most of a patient who you know, present with poisoning epidemiologically age-wise is uh, age from uh, 20 to like uh, 40. But in our setup, usually most are uh, below So, so prolonging CPR is, uh, is important for uh, uh, patients who presented uh, with poisoning uh, because of, uh, because of um, patient uh, epidemiology, which is usually the young uh, patient with no co uh, medical comorbidities. So the chance of recovering this patient uh, is high, so we need to uh, prolong uh, doing uh, the resuscitations. So while resuscitating this patient, we have to also consider giving antidote if uh, the poisonous agent have uh, got an antidote. So consider antidote is important. Regarding cardiac arrhythmia, so arrhythmia is also common uh, in uh, some uh, poisonous agent, especially those uh, which has got an effect on uh, sodium channel, uh, specifically like TCA, uh, like amitriptyline and the decoxin uh, can cause uh, different kind of arrhythmias. So managing uh, arrhythmias uh, is sometimes uh, challenging because uh, while managing arrhythmia with anti-arrhythmia uh, medications uh, can cause 
uh, another form of arrhythmia. So uh, the general principle is anti-arrhythmic medications are not first-line uh, medications to treat the arrhythmias. So uh, if arrhythmia happens, so the first thing that we need to do is uh, uh, consider uh, treating other possible uh, correctable uh, causes like uh, treating the hypoxia, treating uh, metabolic uh, complication, acid-based abnormalities, are uh, one of uh, a few principles that we need to follow. And uh, depending on the poisonous agent, uh, we can also give con uh, consider giving antidotes, uh, specifically for uh, digoxin related arrhythmias, we can give uh, digoxin uh, fab and sodium bicarb for uh, TCA cycle. So if arrhythmia happens because of this uh, poison agent, we can consider giving additionally an antidote. Otherwise, for other arrhythmias, uh, for other uh, for arrhythmia caused by other poisonous agent, more of the general principle of management is just treating the underlying causes. So uh, seizure can also happen in, uh, in a patient who presented with seizure and a patient who presented with uh, poisoning. So management principle of uh, seizure in a poisoning patient is um, giving uh, benzodiazepines, which are first line uh, medications, but specifically uh, patient who present with INH uh, poisoning, uh, we can consider giving uh, pyridoxine, which is a first line uh, medications. Otherwise, the seizure caused by NH usually is refractory to benzodiazepine. So consider giving pyridoxine. And uh, so seizure can be also caused by uh, metabolic complications because of the poisonous agent. So always we need to consider other uh, metabolic abnormality, electrolyte abnormality, and try to uh, no, uh, uh, rule out or no rule in and then manage accordingly. And uh, the second line medication is uh, barbiturate. So um, if it is resistant to benzodiazepine, we can consider giving uh, barbiturate. But regarding phenytoin, you know, phenytoin is a first line medication for uh, seizures in other uh, conditions, but specifically for a patient. Uh, which is a seizure, poison uh, related seizure is pentoin has got no role other than other it can complicate. Uh, so it's better to avoid pentoin. So uh, after you resuscitate, after you secure the ABC of life, then the next step is uh, you know, look for the specific poison agent. So the, the, the thing we can do to uh, uh, clear out the poisonous agent is, you know, we need to have a good history and do also physical examination and uh, follow some uh, protocols, which we'll uh, discuss in a few minutes. So history-wise, we need to obtain a clear history. I know that it's always difficult to get a clear history from the patient because patient might not be uh, willing because of uh, their suicidal intentions, because of uh, repercussions, judgment, and so on. So uh, it's better to you know, I take time and talk to the patient and uh, the private conditions to get uh, the clear uh, drug. And also a number of exposed persons like carbon monoxide poisoning, organophosphate poisoning, and so on. They have to know <clears throat> the, uh, the degree of uh, poisoning and type of exposure, amount, dose, and the root. Uh, also very important to predict the, the, uh, the, the, the natural conditions of uh, the poisoning. So, and uh, the patient intent is also uh, should be determined because the patient who uh, uh, commits suicide by taking these poisonous, so these patients are very high risk. So we need to admit such patients and assess for uh, uh, for underlying uh, psychiatric conditions. Uh, so uh, patient intention should be also uh, identified. And if it is difficult to get the history from the patient self, uh, patient self, so we need to you know, proceed to the collateral uh, history. We can try to get history from the family and also from any uh, witness person or from AMT and uh, so we can check for the empty bottles, uh, containers, and we can even uh, check for the smell of uh, the patient, unusual containers found uh, close to the patient. And uh, if uh, 
if possible also if there is a no suicidal note some patient has been wrote also suicide note before committing the suicide so we have to uh, look for and the other very important thing is uh, from my experience you know, I have, uh, have uh, uh, I was fortunate to see a lot of a poisoning patients uh, with di different range of uh, presentation. And uh, so one of the patients I <clears throat> found was a patient who was found a coma early in the morning. And he was brought by the family and it was really very difficult to know which medication he took. So uh, the thing we did, we did was we, we take, we take <clears throat> try to talk the tail history specifically uh, since he was uh, uh, a young guy uh, with no underlying uh, psychiatric issue, it was very difficult to uh, know the specific agent. But finally, after knowing that he was a, a pharmacist, we even uh, reached to the pharmacy and we tried to uh, know the medications which were available in the pharmacy uh, during those uh, time. And he was he was. It was actually fan over that he took. Uh, so we can even go to uh, this uh, degree uh, to get the type of uh, the type of medication that, 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 that the patient took. And also the other very important thing is the patient has underlying medical conditions, especially those patients with um, a seizure disorder, uh, epilepsy, and also a psychiatric uh, problem. Most likely these patients are on some uh, type of medications. So knowing the type of uh, medical conditions and also type of medication the patient has been taking is uh, has been taking also very important. And one time also I, uh, I encountered a patient who presented in coma after taking uh, pain or bar, uh, which was uh, not taking for uh, the seizures. So these history are very important. And uh, physical examination should be also done uh, thoroughly. We need to undress the patient completely. Uh, and also we have to check for any object or substance type to uh, the clothes. And we have to assess the general appearance of the patient, uh, uh, degree of uh, mental status, agitation, confusion, and also uh, of conditions. And skin exam is also sometimes very important, especially patient can not present with uh, bruising, which is you know, trauma, cyanosis, which is because of carbon dioxide poisoning, flashing, and so on. And eye exam for Blurry size, uh, there are uh, no conditions in which a patient can have uh, pinpoint pupils specifically from uh, opioid and organophosphate uh, poisoning and uh, nystagmus, which is usually caused by PCP. And depending, anyways, on uh, the pupillary size, we can have certain uh, differential diagnosis. And uh, other examination, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, uh, some agent which can cause uh, physiologic excitations. So these are uh, anticholinergic, sympathomimetic, or uh, hallucinogenic agents. And it can be also because of drug withdrawal. So this patient can present with uh, physiologic excitation like uh, being tachycardic, hypertensive, and also uh, hyperthermic and the patient can be also agitated. So in a patient with this condition, you need to have certain uh, differential diagnosis like anticholinergic and also uh, those, uh, those uh, differential images. And uh, some patients can also present in a depressive mood like with low respiratory rate, low blood pressure, and uh, low uh, mental status. So these are uh, due to cholinergic, sympatho, uh, uh, opioid, and sedative hypnotic agent and uh, uh, alcohols. And there are also uh, co uh, agents that can cause a mixed state. So uh, sometimes it's really very difficult to uh, know specific agent by just history and physical examinations. So one thing we can still narrow down our differential diagnosis is by following toxic drums. These are uh, the toxic drums like uh, cholinergic, hallucinogenic, and uh, hypoglycemic. So, what does toxidrome mean? So, toxidrome is you know uh, certain class of medication have a common sign the symptoms. So, depending on this a specific um, sign the symptoms, we can narrow down our uh, class of medications. So, recognizing the presence of uh, toxidrome may help. Uh, to uh, narrow our differential diagnosis and to identify the toxins. So these are uh, 
as I mentioned previously, anticholinergic, which can present with uh, tachycardia, hypertension, and so on, and cholinergic hallucinations. So depending on this <clears throat> toxidrome, we can uh, narrow our differential diagnosis. And after narrowing our differential diagnosis, we can, in certain conditions, we can tend for uh, toxicological uh, screening, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, only few of uh, poisonous agents have uh, a screening uh, uh, tool. Uh, so it is really very limited and it does not contribute significantly. But it may role, it may play a role in evaluation of uh, children also, and also in certain other conditions, especially the patient who presented with um, uh, fine poisoning, salicylate poisoning, and uh, acetamol, as a, a paracetamol acetamol poisoning. You now, sending for toxic screen is very important. So for undifferentiated and severe poisoning, you now sometimes uh, it's better to send for acetaminophen and salicylate. Uh, level determinations. So only a few medications uh, uh, can be assessed by sending serum levels. So these are few, like phenobar, uh, acetam, digoxin, phenytoin, carbamides. Most of anticonvulsant have uh, serum level determinations. So one of the scenarios I can mention here is uh, there was, as I mentioned previously, there was a, pa uh, a patient presented with uh, coma, and uh, it was really very difficult initially to know whether uh, the coma is because of um, uh, meningitis, whether it is because of poisoning or uh, trauma. Uh, because patient uh, was she was found unconscious in her room, so uh, when we assess for her uh, underlying medical conditions, uh, we were told that she was <clears throat> taking uh, phenobar uh, for uh, seizure. And then uh, we suspected phenobar poisoning, and then send for serum level, and it was really very high. And then we considered dialysis, and after a few sessions, so. Dialysis, uh, she was awake and discharged after a uh, few weeks and then staying in the hospital. So, especially phenobarb is one of the medications which uh, we send for a serum label because uh, the diagnosis is also very easy and the management. Uh, if you get the patient early and uh, give him the few sessions of dialysis, the outcome is really uh, rewarding. So, serum label is also very important. Then uh, decontaminations. So, and practically, we usually tend to give a priority for uh, decontaminations uh, instead of uh, securing ABC of life. But you know, the priorities for uh, ABC of life decontamination has really got a uh, few advantages, especially uh, the GI decontamination. We'll discuss it later. So, decontamination can be. Uh, from uh, cutaneous decontamination or from GI decontamination. So generally, decontamination is achieved by undressing the patient and washing uh, the patient thoroughly with copen, uh, copious amount of uh, water. So this thing should happen outside of its ED to prevent uh, cross-contamination uh, with other patients and also uh, staff. So this should be happen in an isolated area because uh, uh, these poisonous agents uh, are also uh, hazardous and uh, should be also uh, put in, 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 a, in a specified uh, box and should be dis discarded and uh, patient should be initially in an isolated area. So regarding uh, eye decontamination, so in, uh, uh, I uh, can be also uh, affected by uh, certain chemical injuries. So especially uh, alkalis are <clears throat> terminated to cause a significant uh, eye injury because uh, as we know, alkali can cause liquefied, liquefied uh, uh, necrosis. So it can cause uh, deep uh, injury. So always when you encounter that, uh, such patient, we need to irrigate copiously with around uh, two liter of NS, you can up, even uh, take up to uh, one hour. So we have to uh, irrigate uh, thoroughly for a uh, prolonged time so that we can prevent the damage. So 
since the patient usually complain pain, now applying uh, topical tetracin, uh, uh, local anesthetics is uh, very important to make the patient uh, comfortable and to thoroughly regate. And uh, specifically for uh, alkali injury, uh, we have to uh, now communicate for ophthalmologic uh, consultation because the degree of injury is very high uh, in alkali uh, exposure. So we have to you know, uh, have ophthalmologic uh, consultation specifically for alkali. And uh, when to stop uh, irrigations in ideal setup, we have to have uh, conjunctival uh, pH. So uh, we stop usually the pH is uh, less than uh, 7.5. So regarding GI uh, contaminations, so there are uh, three general methods involving removing the toxins. So one is from stomach via mouth, like uh, vomiting or uh, lavage. And uh, the other is by binding it inside the gut lumen to prevent uh, absorption. And the third is mechanically flushing it through GI tract. Uh, so each method has got benefit and risks. So the first is gastric impeding via uh, emesis. So emesis, as we know, it is uh, inducing a vomiting. So this is done usually uh, by giving a syrup of IPCAC. So it can be, uh, though the dose is around uh, 50 ml. So usually within 20 minutes, we expect vomiting. And uh, so there are associated complications like patient can not develop aspirations, bohirbia syndrome, malory waste there, and intractable vomiting. But generally, this is no longer recommended because <clears throat> when we compare the risk and benefit, you know, the, risk ben the risk outweighs the benefits. So it is always better to avoid giving uh, this syrup of IPCAC because there's no <clears throat> mortality benefits. And uh, gastric impeding, so gastric impeding is uh, by inserting any tube and then flashing is normal saline. So uh, when we insert, uh, we have to use the largest size uh, NG tube uh, reaching up to uh, 40 French. And in <clears throat> children, it can reach up to 24. So we have to use the largest one. So we leverage it with uh, room temperature water until uh, the, the the content become uh, clear. Usually this is indicated with one hour of ingestion. And uh, we can also use the energy tube for, uh, to give our administer a charcoal. So we should not remove uh, the energy tube because it has got additional benefits. So orogastric lavage has got also certain uh, contraindications. You know, if it is large pills, so it is uh, it's very difficult to you know remove uh, large pills. So it's better to avoid. And if we are sure that it is non-toxic ingestion by just inserting any tube and doing lavage, you know, it can cause more harm than benefit. So if you are sure that it is non-toxic, it's better to avoid. And uh, non, uh, life threatening also the same. If it is a caustic ingestion, it is also better to avoid because when we do lavage, we can cause a second injury. So caustic ingestion is one of the contraindication uh, for lavaging. And a patient with compromised airway, especially patient with low GCS in which no patient is unable to protect the airway, it is better to avoid uh, lavage because that can cause aspiration, that can cause hypoxia and patient can die of uh, type 1 respiratory failure. So it is better. And hydrocarbon is also uh, one of the contraindications because when we lavage a uh, patient who uh, in, took hydrocarbon, that can cause injuries to uh, uh, airways. So uh, it's better to avoid. So there are certain complications. Uh, while doing lavage, patient can develop massive aspiration and also vaginal or gastric perforation insertion into trachea. So these are a few complications. So we have to always be cautious. And the drug removal range from uh, 75 to 56. So uh, the next is activated uh, charcoal. So charcoal uh, is uh, one of the few uh, uh, decontaminant, which is strongly recommended. It is uh, most appropriate agent to decontaminate GI tract. Of all the decontaminant, the most important one is uh, charcoal because it absorbs toxin in gut lumen and prevents 
aspirin uh, uh, reabsorption into uh, the system. So, uh, so the benefit is we can decontaminate without requiring invasive procedures like uh, dialysis. So it is uh, safe both in adults and the children, and the dose is uh, one gram uh, per kg. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are certain contraindications for activated charcoal. One is if uh, a patient is anticipated uh, not to protect the airway, that's one uh, complica uh, contraindication. And the other is esophageal or uh, gastric perforation if suspected. So it's better to you know, avoid because that's what also complications. And uh, complications is uh, the same with that of any two uh, lavas, like patient can develop aspiration or also impaction is possible. And uh, indication wise, we don't do uh, uh, activated charcoal or give act activated charcoal for all patients. There are certain medications uh, which cannot be uh, absorbed by uh, charcoal. So these are like alcohol, heavy metals, hydrocarbons, and uh, acid and alkali. So this poisonous agent cannot be absorbed. So there is no point of giving uh, uh, charcoal for those cases. And uh, <clears throat> in certain cases, as I said, charcoal is usually given within one hour of uh, uh, taking the uh, poisonous agent. So in certain uh, uh, drugs, we can give uh, even after uh, one hour of lapse. So these medications are uh, phenobarb, carbamazepine, and sustained release product because these medications are anticipated to stay in the GI for more than one hour, especially phenobarb, you know, uh, is thought to delay uh, gastric impeding. So if we are able even uh, to do charcoal after one hour, uh, the chance of absorbing the drug is high. So we can do it even after one hour. And aspirin, it for, usually forms it coalesce and <clears throat> it causes uh, a bezoar. So uh, we can still get it if we do it after one hour. So that's called uh, multi dose. And uh, we can also repeat the dose after. Uh, the first dose, usually the first dose is sufficient, but in uh, certain medications like aspirin, penobar, uh, there is also a place of giving multi-dose charcoal. So <clears throat> wall bowel irrigations. So wall bowel irrigation is one of the decontaminant uh, ways in which we can remove the drug from the GI. So this is by using polyethylene glycol, which induces uh, diarrhea. So we are just large quantity mechanically uh, by NG2. So this will uh, mechanically force the substance uh, to exit via uh, GI tract. So it will uh, it's thought to not limit the toxin absorptions. So the common indications for wall bowel irrigations, uh, especially for uh, body packers, you no know, uh, people tend to you not know, uh, transport or transfer this uh, uh, abuse substance uh, by ingesting. Uh, so these body packers, uh, what we usually do is we just irrigate the GI. You know, if we try to uh, remove it by you know, uh, doing endoscopy or uh, by surgery, the, ch the chance of uh, perforating the the pack is uh, very high likely. So if we perforate the chance of a you know, patient dying from this um, poisonous agent is very high. So usually what we do is we just irrigate the bowel. We wait for the patient to you know, defecate yeah, the rectum and uh, that's how we tend to uh, treat those patients. And uh, other heavy metals uh, and also uh, iron detain can be also irrigated. So second to uh, activate the child call, the second most uh, important one is uh, wall bowel education. That's what's thought to you know, cause a higher chance of uh, removing the substance with less complications. So in the point is uh, clearing the rectal effluent and the contraindication is patient as uh, preceding the area. Uh, GI bleeding, perforation, absent bowel sound, obstructions, we don't do uh, 
poor irrigations and the complication patient can develop uh, bloating, cramping, and uh, rectal irritations. And uh, sometimes also patient, these patients uh, can also develop frequent vomiting. So usually pre-medicate this patient with antimetics. And uh, <clears throat> after decontamination, the uh, other uh, options is enhanced eliminations. So we eliminate those medication already, uh, those medications which are in the system. So decontamination is before absorption. So elimination is if the medication is already absorbed and it is in the system. So we can use certain uh, procedures to eliminate. So these are alkalinization, acidification, forced diuresis, and hemodialysis. We'll see. Uh, one by one. So alkalinization, so this is most effective for uh, most effective for weak acid, primarily eliminated by uh, renal tract. So for a patient who took uh, weak acid, we can uh, alkalinize uh, the patient and so this alkali can you know ionize the weak acid and uh, prevent reabsorption from re renal tubular uh, cells. So uh, this is one of the pre, uh, management options. So always we have to make sure that uh, there is no hypokalemia before alkalinization because hypokalemia can reduce the effectiveness of urinary alkalinization and it can also even worsen the degree of hypokalemia and the patient can develop um, cardiac arrest because of uh, the hypokalemia. So we might tend to worsen the hypokalemia. So always you need to make sure that uh, there is no hypokalemia or if there is hypokalemia, we have to correct uh, the low potassium before considering alkalinization. And uh, the primary indication is to uh, for moderate and severe salicylate so, and phenobar. So these are a few substances which uh, we can consider alkalinization. So specifically, uh, salicylate and phenobar poisoning, we can you know, alkalinize and uh, uh, the outcome is really very good. Especially if we are not in a setup where we can uh, provide hemodialysis, so we can consider. So we can also consider for uh, 2,4-D and also uh, alcohol poisoning and uh, so this is uh, alkalinization usually done by giving sodium bicarb at a dose of one to two milliequivalent per kg. So there are associated complications while we give uh, sodium bicarb. One is worsening of the hypokalemia and also hypernatremia, fluid overload, metabolic alkalosis, and so on. So always when we administer uh, such medication, we have to anticipate the complications and uh, treat accordingly. So acidification of urine is for a uh, weak basis, but uh, the bad thing about acidification of urine is usually the risk of acidification outweighs the benefits. So it is not recommended to acidify because the risk of rhabdomyolysis by acidifying the urine is very high. So it is no longer recommended. Forced diarrhea is also not recommended by giving LASIKs the chance of removing the poisonous agent is very low. Rather, the patient can go into a shock and acute kidney injury. So forced diarrhea is also not advised. Hemodialysis, <coughs> hemodialysis is, uh, is uh, usually uh, limited indications in poison uh, patient. Only few medications uh, are dialysable. So it has got uh, certain indications. So one is uh, uh, the substance should have a low volume of uh, distribution and it has to have also low molecular weight and relatively low protein binding. So such substances uh, can be dialyzed. Otherwise, if it doesn't fulfill this criteria, uh, the advantage of doing hemodialysis is uh, it will be futile. So uh, there is no uh, importance. So there are uh, certain uh, toxins uh, which we can uh, remove by dialysis. One is salicylate and alcohol, ethylene, uh, alcohol, uh, say it, lithium, theophylline, and phenobarb. These are uh, the medication or toxins that can be uh, dialyzed. So if you find such case, please uh, consider uh, referral for uh, possible dialysis. Uh, 
So contraindication for hemodialysis, like low blood pressure for infants, we don't do uh, hemodialysis and the poor vascular access, there is significant coagulopathy. So these are a uh, few uh, contraindications. All right, so disposition. As we said, most uh, around 95% of uh, patients who present with poisoning have minimal uh, injuries. So more, this patient can be you know, uh, discharged at home. So there are also a uh, few other patients you know, which needs ICU. So we have to be you know, familiar with those patients who need to be uh, dis uh, dismissed for emergency or who should be admitted to ward or ICU. So this is based on uh, the patient uh, presentations, patient, uh, the, the poisonous agent which the patient uh, took. So usually observation period of four to six hours for low predicted severity or for moderate observed severity. Uh, for, uh, for low, we can observe just for four to six and then uh, discharge them from emergency. But for those with moderate uh, toxicity, uh, those patients should be admitted to intermediate uh, work or should be also an emergency and we, um, followed for a few days. And if there is no complication, they can be discharged. But uh, those patients with significant toxicity should be uh, admitted to ICU. So uh, all patients with intentional overdose, as we said, always we have to uh, make sure that uh, um, the patient, uh, we have to identify whether the patient uh, it took the medication intentionally or not. So if uh, it is because of uh, suicidal attempt, you know, uh, before discharge, we have to uh, risk stratify the patient. There is a score. So depending on that score, uh, we have to uh, require psychiatric assessment before uh, discharge because those patients with underlying psychiatric illness should be uh, treated before uh, considering discharge because this patient after discharge he can come with another attempt and they might even uh, complete the suicide. So always make sure that uh, psychiatric evaluation before discharge. So disposition wise, uh, uh, disposition to ICU. Uh, so, a uh, patient with this uh, uh, mentioned criteria should be admitted to ICU. One is a patient, uh, if we do, if we are able to do ABG and the PCO2 is greater than 45, if the patient is retaining carbon dioxide, we can, we need to admit to ICU because this patient can develop type 2 respiratory failure. So this is one of the indications and uh, the other is need for emergency intubation if the patient is uh, unable to protect the airway or needs uh, ventilatory support. So that's one of the indication and post ingestion seizure, patient also develops seizure, that is not a good sign. So we need to admit the patient to ICU and observe. And if there is arrhythmia, uh, whether it is non-sinus or any degree of uh, block, and uh, if there is hypotension and uh, prolonged QRS, so these are a uh, few indications to consider admissions. I see. So is activator charcoal available in our setup? Uh, truly speaking, we don't have activator charcoal in my hospital, but I've heard that there are a few hospitals with uh, toxic center, toxic center and let's suppose. So that talk center is using activated charcoal. Otherwise, we don't have charcoal in my hospital. Shall we communicate? Yes, we can. I can give you uh, the slide. So Sanya, is normal and recommended for GI decontamination? Yes. So GI decontamination is just crystalloid. So normal saline can be used. How can we suspect GI perforation in a comatous uh, poisoning patient? So GI perforation is a clinical diagnosis. So patient with GI perforation can present with abdominal distension and uh, tenderness, rigidity, and so on. So if you find such patient, it is better not to uh, uh, no, give a uh, lavage and any GI uh, procedure should be avoided. Rather, the patient is laparotomy. 
So especially those uh, medications, especially patients who present with acid poisoning, you know, these uh, patients are at risk for uh, GI perforation. So always we need to suspect that the patient might develop uh, GI perforation. So we need to avoid any GI procedure in these patients. How can we get quiz link? How to approach organophosphate poisoning when it's golden time for atropia? So organophosphate poisoning is really very uh, rampant in our setup because of uh, most of our uh, farmers use organophosphate for, as a pesticide. So organophosphate poisoning, unfortunately, has got an antidote, which is an atropine. So atropine is one of the medications that we need to give uh, while <clears throat> securing ABC of light because uh, it has short uh, half-life and a short onset. So we can get an effect within a few minutes, especially patients who presented with uh, pulmonary edema, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm, please consider giving atropine. So atropine is, uh, uh, is both diagnostic and therapeutic, especially in a patient who presented with this um, uh, sledge B. Uh, if you give atropine and it is not responding, most likely uh, the poisonous agent is organophosphate. So you have to uh, consider giving more atropine. But if the secretion and everything clears away with just first dose of atropine, that is against organophosphate. Usually uh, organophosphate poisoning, uh, signs or symptoms, usually it takes few minutes, few, um, or uh, like few doses of uh, atropine before uh, clearing. So it is both diagnostic and therapeutic. What will be the initial ventilatory setting for uh, patient with uh, poisoning? So for patient with um, uh, honey's ventilatory support, so the, uh, the, the setting should be standard, but still it depends on patient conditions. So uh, we can uh, use, uh, and the, the more which we are really comfortable with, I usually tend to use uh, ventilator uh, mode and uh, tidal volume like six to eight ml per kg. And uh, PIP, I can start with five, but is a patient, I, patient yeah, has got significant pulmonary edema, I can scale the PIP as high as like 20. So this is a setting that we use. Any specific management for zinc phosphide poisoning? Uh, zinc phosphide poisoning. Uh, currently, I uh, have uh, like in, in, uh, I've been working in, in some uh, rural hospital for like four or five years, and uh, I had a chance to see a loss of zinc phosphide poisoning. And fortunately, I only, uh, unfortunately, I only saved one patient. So this patient usually presented with sudden cardiovascular collapse, you know. They came walking, talking, not in distress, but when we measure the blood pressure, uh, the blood pressure is usually very low, uh, depending on the amount of uh, the, the agent that they took. Only even one tap, I think one fourth of the tap can kill the patient. So zinc phosphide is, is very, as a killer. So management wise, management mostly uh, the, uh, the, we don't have antidotes, uh, just more of uh, supportive, but uh, we can consider giving um, uh, sodium bicarb and also magnesium, but these are more of a case report. There is no clear evidence. Milk for poisoning. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, culturally, we tend to give milk for uh, poisonous agent, but there is no proven efficacy of giving milk. Rather, we might cause uh, aspirations, so there is no strong recommendations. So milk, okay, what maximum dose of atropine? So maximum dose of atropine, there is no maximum dose of atropine. Sometimes we can even, uh, you know, hospital use the alone atropine, mulu lincharus in Okay, so there is no maximum dose. We have to go uh, till we uh, clear permidema, so that is a target. So there is no maximum dose. What's the best management in patients who overdose with unknown pills? 
So some, as I said, most of the times, uh, it's really very difficult to uh, uh, be to uh, clearly know which uh, specific agent the patient took. So in those conditions, we have to you know, try uh, uh, by taking history, physical examination, following the toxidrome, but still sometimes it will be very difficult. So if it is uh, unspecified, so we can just give a supportive care because most of these uh, poisonous agents have got an antidote and management is usually supportive. Can we use carbocysteine in place of uh, in acetylcysteine or acetaminophen? I have no experience with carbocysteine, so I cannot comment on that. Milk for cause kind of slide. Management of comatose patient with phenobar poisoning where no antidote is available. So phenobar has got no antidote, rather, uh, as I said, phenobar is one of uh, dialyzable medication. So please, please don't forget to consider uh, sending the patient for uh, dialysis if you suspect phenobar. And uh, if you have also uh, sodium bicarb, you can give uh, sodium bicarb for urinary alkalinization. What is the treatment modality for inhalational poisoning? So inhalational, it can be carbon monoxide, it can be also organophosphate. So it depends on the agent. So if it is carbon dioxide, the, the uh, management is uh, high flow oxygen, 100% oxygen for organophosphate and others, it depends on the agent. So what's your comment on atropic dose escalation? So this is one of the controversial uh, thing. So different book recommends uh, different dose uh, escalation, but what we need to agree on is we should not uh, suddenly stop giving atropine because that can cause rebound pulmonary edema. <clears throat> we might even lose the patient. So uh, on uh, there are standard textbook recommendations. So maybe I can add uh, the atropine dose escalations. And uh, so you can see it. So there is a continuous infusion dosage. I don't exactly remember, but it is from like 0 0.04 to 0 0.1 or 2 milligram uh, per kg per hour. So I can maybe share that. So snake bite must be the dose. Let uh, let's uh, let this be one the last question. So we will not uh, hold you back. Uh, management of paracetamol poisoning in a setup with no antidote. Yeah, so paracetamol poisoning, it is really uh, becoming a problem because paras everybody uh, abuse paracetamol because it is an over over the counter medication. So <clears throat> uh, always we need to have. Uh, uh, high index of suspicion that the patient can develop liver injury. So uh, usually patient with paracetamol present uh, lately with uh, fulminant uh, liver injury. So you have to you know, monitor liver sets for at least a uh, few uh, days. I think as if it's a Yeah, thank you so much doctor for taking your time. I know the network was not uh, fair for us. So uh, we have to yeah. keep this time of you and uh, also our participants. Thank you again. Uh, well, we hope uh, to see you in another setup with another topic in the future. Yeah, I will be happy, I will be happy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you too. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Yes.